Hey, welcome to our YouTube. We're about to listen to a message from our church here in Hillsong, Denmark. Make sure to comment below, like, subscribe, or even share with a friend, and stick around afterwards for different ways to connect. Both here and in Aarhus, can you give a massive welcome to Glenn Barrett as he comes to bring the word? Thanks, mate. Good morning, everybody. Great to see you can grab a seat. Such a joy to be back in, uh, in Copenhagen. I recently did a, uh, a DNA test. Turns out I'm 4% uh, Scandinavian because um, about 700 years ago, some of your ancestors came through to England and uh, were a little bit naughty. So I don't know who I'm related to, but um, thanks. I, I feel kind of a little bit at home here in, uh, in Copenhagen because of that. I'm married to Sophie. We've been married 28 years this year. Sophie is South American, so Chilean but was born in Sydney, Australia. So they left Chile, moved to Australia, and a month later, my wife was born. And we fell in love 30 years ago. I married her 28 years ago, and we had a two-month honeymoon in South America. That's how to start marriage, everybody. And uh, it was amazing. Third day in a married life, I woke up and said, morning, honey, how are you? And she looked at me with fierce Latin eyes, and she punched me really hard on the arm. And I said, what's the matter with you? She said, I had a dream that we had an argument, and I'm still mad with you. <laughs> so I've been in love with her for 28 years and equally frightened of her for 28 years and just sleep with a knife under my pillow just in case she has another dream. Uh, we have uh, two kids. We have um, uh, Georgia and Jaden. Georgia and Jaden. And both of them were born three years apart on the same date. It's because we're disciplined in our house. And- you want to know a key to success? That's the way to do it. But uh, my accent's Australian. Sorry about that. But uh, born in England, raised in Australia. So I moved to Australia when I was two and uh, spent most of my life in Australia before moving to England 28 years ago. And 16 years ago, we launched Audacious Church in the center of Manchester, which is a city that I was born in, which is why I support Manchester City Football Club in Jesus' name. Do we have any Manchester United fans in the house? Give me a wave. Give me a wave. Well, I pray you'd convict them of their sin in Jesus' name. May all the ten plagues of Egypt be upon them. Lice in their bed, boils on their bottoms in Jesus' name. And uh, anyone here support Manchester City? Wow, may God bless you. Make his face shine upon you. May he keep you. May he prosper you always. May good health always be upon you. May you wake up in the morning and discover millions of krona in your bank account in Jesus' name. And does anyone not care about football? Well, Father, save them from their sin, I pray in Jesus' name. Cause them to wake up and realize the days are dark. Well, it's so good to be back. I've got to tell you, I think the first time I was here at Hillsong was maybe about eight or nine years ago, and your youngest was like a baby in a pram. And I still have trauma from what I discovered in Copenhagen because you guys are strange. Did you know that? You, you do things that, that many other people don't in that we went into a restaurant and there was a line of prams with babies outside. Do you still do that? Is that, like, is that still a thing or have you realized that babies do get stolen. I, I remember saying to someone, I said, why do you do that? We wouldn't do that in England. And we're like, why? Because people steal babies. Why would people steal babies? It's because we're English and, and we're weird. All right, turn with me to Mark chapter 14. Love you guys, Thomas and Kat. I, I said to Thomas this week, I, I confessed something. I said, Your, it, Kat's eyes, Kat's eyes are exactly the same as my sister's. So when I first met her 12 years ago or whatever it was, I was like, it's my sister, but, but not. You're, you're, you're much more beautiful than my sister. Okay, um, Mark chapter 14, and uh, let me read a few verses, and then we're just going to jump into some thoughts here. Uh, so excited that you have your Heart for the House offering next weekend, and uh, let's see what God does in this page, 902 in my Bible. Mark chapter 14, while he, that's Jesus, was in Bethany, reclining At the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor and they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them at any time you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. 
She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare me for burial. And truly, I tell you that wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, 2,000 years from now in Copenhagen, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. This account today starts off in a place called Bethany, also known in the Bible as Bethpage. Bethany, you'll find in your reading of the New Testament Scriptures, that Jesus often kind of found his way back in Bethany. Because for Jesus, Bethany was like Mallorca, the place we go on vacation. It's the kind of place that Jesus would go for rest and recuperation. In fact, in the Gospels, we see that Jesus went back to Bethany on 11 occasions because three of his favorite people live there, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. In fact, if we were to stand in in modern day Jerusalem now and you were to go up to the Temple Mount and you were to look out over the Kidron Valley to, to the Mount of Olives and the Garden of Gethsemane in front of you, just over the right hand shoulder there, about about two, three kilometers away from where you're standing is the town of Bethany. And the Bible starts off and says, Jesus is reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper. And it is so important, friends, that when we read the Bible, that we don't just read what it says in black and white before us, but we understand what is being inferred by the writer and their intentions that we would understand. Because in the first phrase, he's in the home of Simon the leper in Bethany. The the writer of the Gospel of Mark wants you to understand something very powerful. He's at the table at the meal table, reclining, eating with Simon the leper and with his disciples. And of course, we just read, there was the religious people that would hang around, around Jesus as well, waiting to catch him out. He's in the home of Simon the leper. Now, what do we know from 2,000 years ago? We know, for example, that people didn't have names the way we have names today. You know, uh, my name is Glyn, G-L-Y-N. It's weird, right? There it is up on screen, G-L-Y-N. And and when I was born, they didn't have a name for a boy. They had a name for a girl. And I don't look like a Karis, do I? And back in those days, you had to name a baby pretty quick. We recently had a baby born in our church. Well, not in our church, but a family in our church. And for four or five days, they, they just couldn't agree on the name for their child. And One day I I rang the the father because the wife had phoned me and said, Pastor Glenn, talk to my husband. And I rang him. I said, said, Adam, we can't keep talking, calling your son him and uh, thing. You got to give him a name, boy. So when I was born, the midwife said to my mom and dad, what do you want to call him? And they're like, well, we don't know. And the midwife said, why do you call him Glenn? And mom went, that'll do. (laughs) Still got trauma. About, about that. But 2,000 years ago, people didn't have surnames as we have surnames today. You, you didn't have a, a surname to, to show that you were from a certain family, the son of or the daughter of. You were known by reputation. You were maybe known by family members. So James and John were the sons of thunder. Jesus was known as Jesus of Nazareth in order to distinguish him from the other Jesuses that were running around at the time, the the Jesus of Capernaum and the Jesus of Jerusalem, Jesus of Nazareth. And you're also known by by, by associations. Uh, So we have blind Bartimaeus and we have Simon the leper. He wasn't born with the name Simon the leper. The is not his middle name. And leper is not a surname. He's known as Simon the leper because he had... He had leprosy. Now, what do we know about leprosy? Well, 2,000 years ago, if you had leprosy, you didn't live in the town. In fact, you would be ostracized from your community. You, you, You were no longer with your family. You would live with lepers. And while we know from our history that there was a leper colony near Bethany, the Bible's very clear that Jesus is in the home of Simon the leper with his followers, with the religious crowd in the town of Bethany. The writer is hoping that you understand that we are on the same page in that I want to suggest to you that even though Simon did have leprosy, 
he could now no longer have leprosy. Now, the Bible doesn't say it in black and white, but if this was a court of law and we were to present the evidence, number one, Simon the leper is in his own home in Bethany. Illegal, outlawed, not possible. Number two, Jesus was there. Possibly Jesus would have gone to leper colonies what would Jesus do? Probably. But the fact that the disciples were there, the women were there, the religious crowd were there, all the evidence suggests he could no longer have leprosy. And the writer is hoping we're on the same page 2,000 years ago in understanding that Jesus, sorry, the leper, Simon, is sitting next to the person who healed him of leprosy in the first place. Wow. I want to propose to you he didn't have leprosy. That lesson in the account is simple, and it's just this, that God is a behind-the-scenes, miracle-working God. Now, the Bible doesn't clearly say in black and white that Jesus healed him of leprosy, but everything about it suggests he does. And I want to say that in your life, God is a behind-the-scenes, miracle-working God. That when you don't see it, when you don't know it, when you don't feel it, God is behind-the-scenes, working Miracles. My son, when he was little, when the house went quiet, my wife and I got worried because we knew he was up to trouble. We knew he was up to mischief. We didn't know what he was doing, but we knew it was not good because my son was quiet. I want you to know that God's very different. That when it feels like he's quiet, he's behind the scenes setting up miracles in your life. Did you know the very fact that you're here today, friends, tells me that miracles have already taken place? You didn't know it. Yeah. The fact that you got breath in your lungs is a miracle. Yeah. The fact that you woke up and you're alive today is a miracle. Yeah. Right. Did you know all through your life, God has been working behind the scenes yeah. to create miracles to enable you to be the person that you are today? He's a miracle oh. working yeah. God. My family are from a little village in Wales next to England. My wife's family are from Santiago and Viña del Mar in Chile. And God, who is Elohim outside of time, he looks down into humanity and he thinks to himself, somehow I've got to get a little Welsh boy from that village and a little Chilean girl from that town and I've got to get them to meet because God in his brilliance looked and saw Georgia and Jaden, my children. You see, you've got to understand that God will get the whole world moving to accommodate His plans just for you. Thousands of years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, it was prophesied that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. But God had a problem because Joseph and Mary didn't live in Bethlehem. They lived in Nazareth. And so when you read the gospel account at Christmas, you're going to read this curious little line. It says this, that the governor decided that everybody should go back to their hometowns to register for a census. And the Bible says that Mary, nine months pregnant, they made their way to Bethlehem and then this perfect little line. It just so happened, as luck would have it, by coincidence, it came time for the baby to be born. There was no luck. It was a fulfillment of prophecy. God was working behind the scenes. Yeah. Did you ever go to a job interview, nervous, wondering, thinking, man, this is way out of my pay scale. This is way beyond my ability. I'm not too sure what I'm going to do. You got in there. You found favor. They offered you the job. You walked out thinking, how did I get that job? I must be good. It's not because you're good. It's because while you were over here nervous about the job interview, God was over here behind the scenes. God was over here preparing the interviewers. And somehow they found themselves talking about someone like you who happened to be you, but you didn't know this conversation was happening while you were over here worried because God was behind the scenes up to good. He's a behind the scenes miracle working God. Now the Bible doesn't say it in black and white, but all the context of this tells me that he is working behind the scenes to create miracles. The Bible calls him Simon the leper. He didn't have leprosy. But isn't it interesting how some people will always try to remind you of the person you were? You ever had moments in your life where you've had breakthrough? You've stepped into a new season. 
that relationship that, that, that hounded you in the past is no longer there and you step into something new or you step out of a diff- challenging time in your life and you step into a new, new moment. Have you noticed how there's always people who are trying to remind you of what you did, of who you were, of what you got up to, of what you were a part of? I have people like that in my life. And usually I run into them on a supermarket when I'm pushing the trolley, you know what I mean? And, I, and I'm putting groceries in there. And as I'm walking down, I see somebody walking the other way and I'm like, oh, dear God above. I know exactly what's gonna happen. They're gonna remind me of things that I've done. They're gonna remind me of problems. They're gonna remind me of my challenges. And yet we've gotta learn, friends, to understand that when people are trying to drag you back to be the person you were, you've almost gotta say, hey, talk to the hand. I ain't listening. That's not who I am, it's who I was, but it's definitely who I'm not gonna be. In Jesus' name. And you may not be where you want to be, but thank God you're not where you were. And so the Bible says here, it says his name was Simon the leper, where a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume called pure nard, broke the jar and poured it on Jesus' head. Now what I want you to see about this is this, is that this nard 2,000 years ago was only grown at the foot of the Himalayas in India in that region of the world. And the nard, this perfume, had to take a journey from the Himalayas, where that specific route would be picked, placed in the cart, designated for Jerusalem, where when it got to Jerusalem, a specific perfumer would take that box, take that route, crush it to be perfect, pure oil, so it could get in this story today. What you've got to understand is this pure nard, this root that was taken from the Himalayas is worth a lot of money. And so it would have had armed escorts the whole way. I mean, the perilous journey from the Himalayas to get into this story in Bethany today. My question for you is this, which was the most dangerous part of the journey for the nard in order for it to get into the story? Was it the journey from the Himalayas to Jerusalem where robbers and bandits and thieves could could, could steal it at any moment? Or was the most perilous part of the journey, the part of the journey where the woman had it for herself but chose to give it away? I want to suggest it's the latter. The most dangerous part was her thinking, this is my precious. But she had a revelation that this nard was picked in order to be poured. And I want to suggest to you today, Hillsong, the same is true of you. That revelation and understanding that you were picked by God to be poured out to this generation. God chose you. You didn't choose him. Years ago, we used to sing a song called I Found Jesus. The reality is this, he was never lost. We never found him, he found us. And there was a moment where you were, you were on the train, the plane, the automobile, you'd been going on a spiritual journey. You tried all sorts of things and there came a moment in your life where God reached out to you and He put saving faith in you and it gave you the ability to say, God, I need you in my life. He picked you. But he didn't just pick you to save you. He picked you to pour you out to humankind. I remember where I was. Country Queensland, Australia. I was 12 years of age. And there was a group of boys in the church. And we had a relationship with God through who our parents were. And so we decided that we were going to pray on a Monday night in our youth pastor's office. And the prayer was really a, a last attempt on our part to really have a real encounter with God. And I remember on this Monday night, we had two rules for this prayer time. Rule number one was this, no adults, because they were part of the problem. And number two, no girls, because we wanted to worship the Creator, not the created, you know what I mean? So on Monday night, we prayed and word got around. Tuesday night, we came back to pray. Thursday, Friday, all the way up to Saturday night. And on Saturday night, there were 60 teenage boys squeezed in the youth pastor's office. Not only did it smell bad, but I can tell you that on that Saturday night, I had an encounter with God that changed 
my life. I, I, was, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I had, a, I had a power encounter with the dunamis, the power of heaven, the dynamite of heaven, the Holy Spirit. It was just this explosive moment in my life. And from that point, I have never been the same again. And today I look back and realize it was at that point I had a growing awareness that I, like you, have been picked to be poured. Do you see what happened here in the account? The Bible says she broke the jar. The only way for the contents of what was on the inside to come out was for the jar to be broken. And I just wonder, is it possible that God allows us to go through seasons of brokenness so that what is on the inside can come out? I think the Bible calls it fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, long-suffering, self-control. And you'll know this, that the only way to savor the sweetness of the fruit is for it to go through the crushing, the breaking. Is it possible that God allows that in your life? He doesn't orchestrate it. Is it possible He allows that? So people can truly see what you have been walking through. And when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, instead of reacting like the world does, people look at you and say, how is it that you can go through such a living hell and still love, joy, peace? You were picked to be poured. Listen, I know you're you're perfect here in Denmark. But I can say this, that in England, I'm more interested in what the Christians in our church are like when they're going through a challenge. Because anyone can worship him on the mountaintop. But it's during the crushing, picked to be poured. Hey, I want to say to you, Hillsong, this, that God picked you to pour out generosity to this world. God picked you to pour out kindness to this world. God picked you to pour out His grace and love and forgiveness. I'm like you. I don't want to forgive people either. When people come against me, I want them to meet thunder and lightning. Hey, I'm 4% Viking. You know what I'm talking about? But, but, but every time I, I, I want to do it, I'm reminded again that God picked me to show the world forgiveness. He picked you to pour you out. I mean, it's crazy about this is that, is that the Bible says she, she, she poured this expensive nard all over Jesus. Jesus later on says, she did it to prepare me for my burial. Did you know this moment and the crucifixion, there was just two days in between? Two days between this pure oil poured on Jesus and hanging on the cross. Two days only. You have people in your life that, Wear just a little bit too much aftershave (laughs) or perfume. You ever gotten a lift in a hotel and you start sneezing by the time you get to the bottom floor because the other person who got in as well, it's like they've had a bath in cologne and you're like, what on earth are you doing? There are some people in our church who when I see them coming, I know that after I've given them a hug or shaken their hand, I'm going to smell of them for the next three days. You you know what I mean? Because it's so pure. Listen, I want to ask you this question. Is it possible that on the cross two days later, As Jesus hung there, a hundred years ago, we used to sing a song saying he could have called 10,000 angels to, to rescue him from the cross. And is it possible for Jesus in his humanity, though he was fully God, he was also fully man, is it possible that, that, that this God-man suffered a moment of, of temptation? He could call 10,000 angels, but then as the breeze kind of blew through the Mediterranean, the Middle East there, maybe, maybe just a breeze caught, caught the, the, the perfume, the smell of this oil from two days ago, and he was reminded in that moment and again that he was picked to be poured. Friend, Jesus didn't save you so you could be like the world. He saved you so you could know he's picked you to pour you out to this nation. That as we go about our business this week, as we go into university and college, as we go back to our family and our community and our workplace situations, that we would know that we go as the aroma of Christ to this generation. Do you smell good? Or do you smell picked to be poured? The Bible goes on here, and I wonder if the musos will come and join me. That would be wonderful. They said, why this waste of perfume? Why this waste of perfume? 
It could have been sold for more than a year's wages. And it's so true, it could have. And they rebuked her harshly, the Bible says. I love that. They rebuked her harshly. I mean, let me kind of define this for you. They rebuked her harshly. Let me define harshly. Ready? Ready for this? It was her perfume. It was her money. What's it got to do with you? What I do with my perfume. What's it got to do with you, what I do with my money? But have you noticed how everyone has an opinion? They have an opinion today on social media. And they had an opinion then in social media. The social gathering, the media of rebuking her harshly. Everybody's got an opinion. Our church is 16 years old, right? And for 16 years, I've pretty much most weeks told vegetarian jokes. It's like a running thing. And um, it's just, I don't know why. I don't know why it started. It just, it just keeps rolling. And, and I could be three minutes and four minutes into a sermon on a Sunday and someone will shout out, Pastor Glenn, vegetarian jokes. <laughs> Everyone's got an opinion. You know, I, I mean, I just, I dare you. Just, just, this afternoon, just put something in social media. Like, I don't know. Trying to think of something without being offensive. Yeah. Praying for Israel today. Everyone's got an opinion. Or, or how about this? You know, put on social media today. Um, just praying about what I'm going to sow into the vision offering, into the heart for the house offering over the next few weeks. Watch, everybody's got an opinion. And if we're not careful, we can allow the opinion of other people, people who are not in our grace zone, to make judgment calls about us. And if we're not careful, we can live our life based on what everybody else thinks because everybody's got an opinion. If I was you, I wouldn't wear those clothes. If I was you, I wouldn't go to that place of vacation. If I was you, I wouldn't go to that church. If I was you, I wouldn't give in that offering. If I was you, I wouldn't be a part of that ministry. If I was you, if I was you, if I was you, if I was you. And before I'm like, okay, 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 okay. But I love what happens in this story because even though they rebuked her harshly, Jesus says, shut up, leave her alone. Hashtag, the moment Jesus defends you. Sometimes all you just got to do is say nothing. And let the God of heaven who picked you to pour you out to this generation, let him defend you. She didn't have to say a thing because Jesus did it all. And then Jesus lands with this beautiful line. She did what she could. I think that's it. I think the answer to a successful life is this. I'm going to do what I can do. Because all you can do is what you can do. I used to say to my children all the time when they were in primary school and in high school and exams would be coming up, I would say to them, kids, just, just do your best. Yeah, but the teachers, don't no, forget the teachers, just do your best. In fact, through all their primary and secondary school years, we'd go into, into classrooms to, to, you know, the parent-teacher days. Do you, do you have that here as well? I'm sure you do. And, 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 and the last thing I ever looked at was their grades. Because we understand, don't we? God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And so if he can use a donkey, he can definitely use my son. Who's, he's 20 and he still can't count to four, but God bless him. Although he's... he's doing well in biblical Hebrew. He's a freak in Hebrew. He just can't count to six. Just, just do, do your best. My mother-in-law is amazing, right? I love my mother-in-law. I love my mother-in-law because my mother-in-law loves me more than she loves her daughter, my <laughs> wife. You know, three times over the years, we've had, my wife and I have had a fierce argument and she's Latin. And she phones her mum, Glenn, 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 Glenn. And her mum says, shut up, shut up, shut up. He's the best thing that ever happened to you. Shut up, shut up, shut up. Go and say sorry. She's wonderful. 28 years ago when I took her daughter from Australia and we moved to England, she grabbed me and she said, son, I want to give you three rules for life. Number one, turn up. Number two, do your best. And number three, walk away. And I cannot tell you how many times those three rules have blessed my life. Turning up is really half the battle. Doing my best is the next part. 
But the real challenge is to disassociate myself from the outcome and just look back and say, you know what? I did my best. And the reality is this, friends, is you can only do what you can do. You can't do what you can't do. You can only do what you can do. And I think for many people, not you guys because you're perfect, but definitely over in Sweden, there's a problem, right? Because many Christians believe more in magic than they believe in miracles. Let let me tell you what magic is. Magic is me in in high school, physics. I mean, physics, trigonometry. I mean, I had to study trigonometry. I have never used trigonometry. None of you have ever used trigonometry, unless you're one of these weird people who have one of these weird jobs, which is 0.0001% of the people, right? But trigonometry. And I would go to bed at night and I would pray because I was a Christian kid. I'd say, God, God, tonight while I sleep with my trigonometry homework, would you would you send a, an angel, a, a fairy, a, a pixie, gosh, I don't care, even a demon to come and do my homework. And I'd go to bed and I'd wake up the next day and be really sad because my, my homework had not happened because I, I wanted magic. Miracles are not magic. Magic are not miracles. The miracles of Scripture always required the participant to do something. The man with the withered hand, stretch out your hand. The man who was lame and couldn't walk, rise up and walk, throw away your begging clothes. It always requires the participation. And you see, the lesson is really clear from this, friends, that if you do what you can do, then God will do what only He can do. And as we come to our Heart for the House offering next week, do what you can do. We, we say to our church, we have our vision offering as well in two weeks' time. And we say to our church, pray and prepare. Be radical, not rec- reckless. Sacrifice luxuries, don't sacrifice living. Give by faith, but not by credit. And, and we've coached the church in this whole season of understanding those four things. But if you do what you can do, then God will do what only He can do. My prayer over this next week is as you pray and you begin to go to God and say, God, in this this offering, what what can I give and how can I sow and how can we sow as a family? I know you're going to hear from God and you know you're going to hear from God. When it's scary, it's probably God. But if you do what you can do, watch what He's about to do. In COVID year 2020, uh, the golf course has opened up again, thank God. In October 2020, I I played a round of golf and I took off my cap and I could still see the shadow of something in my right eye. And I thought, that's weird. To be fair, for six months, I hadn't really brushed my hair. I'd just worn a cap for six months because I'm living at home, right? It's COVID, it's lockdown. And uh, I thought my eye was seeing things. I thought I'd worn a cap so much, a hat, that I could still see the shadow of it. For the next few weeks, it was still there. And so I went to the opticians, the eye people, and she looked in the eye and she goes, oh, that, uh, oh. Oh, yeah, hi, Glenn. Mm, yeah, interesting. I, I'm going to send you to the hospital. I, I just want them to look in your eye a little bit more. And uh, it was COVID. And my emergency appointment took six months. So it wasn't until about March 2021 that I ended up in the hospital. And they started to look in my eye. And you know you're in trouble, don't you, when you end up with six consultants, three doctors in the room, and they're all taking turns looking in your eye. One of the doctors said, hey, Mr. Barrett, we're really sorry, but um, you've got a disease in your eye. And uh, it's amazing because we all work in the eye industry, in the eye profession. Most of us have heard about your condition, but we've never seen it before. They said, we're going to have to operate, otherwise you're going to lose your eye. It's COVID season still, people coming out of COVID. And so it's March and you end up in, in hospital in Liverpool of all places, Liverpool, England, Liverpool, Liverpool, where by the age of two, you know how to steal a car, steal wheels, rob a house. It's an amazing country, amazing city. And I'm in Liverpool in surgery and they remove my eye and they stitch a radioactive shield to the back of my eye and put the eye back in. It was a, it was a, a non-cancerous tumour. And so I'm in hospital for a week, no visitors, of course, and I've got a patch over my eye and then at the end of the week they take my eye out again they remove the radioactive shield and they put the eye back in and stitch the eye muscles back in and, and things like that and they said we, we hope fingers crossed we hope we've fixed your eye and, and you're going to keep your eye gosh I've got to tell you right that was a challenging season and I know some of you in this place have, have walked through 
greater horrors than, than just an eye. I remember three weeks after the operation being at home and I used to wake up at two o'clock in the morning if I had got to sleep and excuse the pun, but everything in my world was really dark. Patch over my eye. And did the operation work? Did it not? Two o'clock every morning for two weeks maybe. The devil in hell. Where's your God now? If he loves you, why are you losing your eyesight? And all these thoughts and turmoil. And in the midst of that, the Lord would speak to me and say, Glenn, do you, do you love me enough to worship me one more time? So at two o'clock in the morning, I would get out of bed. I'd get my phone, put my earpods in. And you know, song number two on my worship playlist was Cornerstone, we sang this morning. When we start singing, I'm like, my gosh, that's, that's, that's my song for miracles. And I'm here to let you know that I haven't got the sight back in this eye. I've got 30% vision. So when I look with that eye, Thomas is so attractive. <laughs> it's a blessing, actually. It's, it's... But through the whole thing, I just was learning the lesson. If I do what I can do, then God can do what only He can do. The doctor said to me two weeks ago, that's it, there's nothing more we can do. Every month they've been putting needles into my eye to try to restore the sight. It's been, a, it's been, it's been an interesting journey, I, I can say this. And so this morning when you prayed for miracles, Thomas, you know, yeah, I, I took my glasses off. I do it every Sunday. I do it every time as a prayer for Mila healing and miracles. And, and I, I can't fix it, but I know someone who can. And I'm going to do what I can do. I'm going to lift my hands in faith and say, okay, God, today could be the day. This could be the moment. And I open my eye and, okay, not, not yet, maybe, 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 maybe later, but if you do what you can do, don't freak out about an offering. Just do what you can do and watch the behind the scenes miracle work in God. Activate a miracle in your life. And I can honestly say that through the vision offerings that Sophie and I have taken over all the years, we've seen God do things again and again and again. Because we did what we could do. Come on, would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I, I want to take a moment. I am six minutes over. Please forgive me. Just, I, I want to pray a prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you 2,000 years later for this amazing story of this incredible woman who had a revelation that the nard was picked to be poured. And so, dear God, I pray in the name of Jesus, just as we as a church come to our Heart for the House offering next week, Lord, without any stresses and without any pressure, Spirit of God, I pray that even this week, even right now, would you drop a figure, an amount in people's hearts and minds. Lord Jesus, I pray that hearing from you and being encouraged to respond to you and to the vision of this house, Father, thank you for miracles that are about to flow in our lives because we're going to do what we can do. And secondly, for those of you who are in a challenging situation right now, whatever it is, family, business, finances, health, the Lord says, do what you can do and I will do what only I can do. Father, I pray in the midst of challenge for so many people, be the God of miracles, I pray, the God Elohim. I pray, God, our cornerstone, would you come and would you do what you do best? Come and do the impossible, the immeasurably more that we've already sung about today, I pray, in the Name of Jesus. Lord, we take our eyes off magic. We look our eyes, put our eyes upon the God of heaven and earth and believe that You, God, will do great miracles in all of our lives in the Name of Jesus. We give You praise. We thank You for Your Word in Jesus' Name. Amen. Amen. Come on, can we thank God for His Word today? Come on, can we just thank Glenn for that message? Absolutely brilliant. As he was talking about his DNA samples, I was like, I'm actually 50% British. So I don't know if we're cousins or whatever, but that's, there's something there. That's amazing. But 
You know, before we finish, um, I just want to pray for one more group of people, whether you're here in Copenhagen, you're in Aarhus, or in the Parents' Lounge, or online, wherever you might be. You know, that's those of you that don't know Jesus like this. You know, you might have a million reasons why you don't believe in God, and you kind of like just line them all up, and you're ready to fire them off whenever someone mentions even the possibility of a God. But then there is the person in the experience of God that stands here now, And like Glenn, he said before, you know, he will move all of earth to create this moment. You might think that you're here today for just a coincidence that someone invited you along. Someone said, hey, we're going to a show. And you're like, wait a minute, this is not a show. <laughs> What is this? Truth is, there is no coincidence in the room. God has created this moment only for one thing, and that's to tell you how much he loves you to tell you how much He loves you. This Bible, it's not a book of rules and regulations. This is a love letter from God to you where He invites us in on the story, His story. And I'd love to pray for anyone here that you've never said yes to Jesus or for whatever reason you once knew God, but you walked away. Maybe it was a situation, something happened, a circumstance where you're like, what? if that's what life is like, man, I'm out. But what you don't understand is that God, He's there and He wants to walk it out with you. I can't promise that when you walk out of here that there's going to be no trouble and no challenges, but I can promise this, that you will never face them alone. That God goes with you. That He lives within, he lives within you. And He wants to walk those seasons alongside you. And so I want to just pray for anyone here that you don't know J Jesus like this. Even during the service and during the sermon and during the worship, you you've felt this something inside of you as if you're like, man, what is that? That's your heart that recognizes home. We've all been created by God, for God. And whenever you come into the presence of God, it's like that GPS, it just turns on. It's like, wait a minute, I know this. It's the presence of God. And so I want to ask everyone just to close your eyes, bow your heads. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus like this and you say, Thomas, I want to, I want to know Jesus like that. I want to have that kind of an assurance that even in the face of, of obstacles that I can know that I know that I know that God He loves me and He's with me so I'm going to count to three and when I get to three I want every person who wants to say yes for the first time or today you're coming back when I say three just lift your hand so I know who I'm praying for Are you ready one don't let this moment slip by don't put it off to a moment you're not guaranteed you have we have right here and right now two I'm not talking to the person next to you in front of you behind you I'm talking to you Not even saying go out and become perfect and then come back and then He will love you. No, He already loves you. All that's left for you to do is to say yes to the free gift of salvation that cost Him everything. So when I say three, I want every person wants to say yes for the first time or today you're coming back, just lift your hand. You ready? On three, three. Just lift your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful, in Aarhus as well, in Parents' Lounge, up here. Thank you. That's amazing. Anyone else here? So good. So good. You can put your hands down. That's what we're going to do. We're going to say a prayer together. And we're all going to pray together because we're family here. Amen. And But especially those who lifted our hands. Oh, baby, you did it, but you know you should have. Come on, this is your moment. So just repeat this prayer after me. Just say, Dear Jesus. Thank you, for your love. Thank you for your love. I'm sorry for my mistakes, for my mistakes. And, my and my sin. But today I choose you. But today I, choose you. I make you my Lord and Savior. Lord and, Savior. From today, and from today, I'm a follower of Jesus. Follower of Jesus. I, am I am forgiven and I am free. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Come on, can we congratulate and celebrate every person making this decision? Amazing. Hey, if you prayed that prayer, massive congratulations. We celebrate with you because we understand the potential of this moment. And you know, now one thing is to make a decision. Now it is a matter of walking it out. And we want to help you with that. And one of the things we want to do is that we want to give you a free gift. It's a New Testament Bible from our church to you. We've got Danish or English versions. So in Aarhus or in the parents' lounge or in the room here, just over here, Lasse, whose birthday it was last week where he turned 22. 
uh, he'll be over here with the team. Uh, on my left hand side, if you want prayer afterwards, uh, we will have a prayer team ready to pray. George Kamara, whose birthday it was yesterday. Our general manager, 50 years old. 50 years old. And speaking of England, uh, he is South African. And yesterday there was a semi-final in the rugby. And the last minute, South Africa said, happy birthday to George Kamara. Well done. I was with Glenn Barrett and he said a lot of non-Christian things at that moment. <laughs> So if you made that decision, please come down. We'd love to talk with you. Hey, tonight, everybody say tonight. Tonight, five o'clock, Glenn is preaching again. Uh, Jonathan is still with us. The team is with us. Uh, young people are going to be part of um, worship, and they're, they're going to be ha having a hangout at four o'clock. Church starts at five. Can I encourage everyone? Let's be inviting friends. You know, we pray for our friends to find Jesus, but like we just heard, let's do what we can do, and let's trust God with the rest. Why don't we stand to our feet? And if you will, would you grab the hands of the person next to you? We're going to pray for one another. I want to do a big shout out to Yan Locke, who's standing right here. This is Yan. Just give me a wave. Yan, just lift your hand. Yan, I haven't seen Yan since 1996, where we went to school together. And I saw him walk in this morning. So it's amazing. It's good to see you. We went on a missions trip together in 1996 in Romania. It's so good, man. This is awesome. That's Naomi. She's Romanian. So there you go. Anyone else we want to point out? That's Reuven. He gives uh, random information before the service. All right, come on. Let's pray for another. Jesus, we just thank you so much, Lord God, for the people on our left and our right. Lord, we pray for your blessing over their lives, Lord God. We thank you that where there is sickness, that you heal, Lord God. That where there is lack, that you provide. Where relationships are strained, we thank you that you reconcile and you restore. And Lord, we lift up every single person in our lives that do not know you. And Lord, I pray that you can use our voice, our lives, Lord God, to reach out an invitation for people to come and see for themselves that they too might have an encounter with you. Even today, Lord God, and Lord, we pray for this week as we're going into to our heart for the house, Lord God. Lord, we just pray for miracles to be outworked in people's lives, Lord God. We thank you, whatever the devil has meant for evil, that you will turn it around and work it for good, Lord God. So we give you all the glory and all the praise for what you're doing in our lives and through our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said together, Amen. Amen. Come on, can we thank God for who He is? Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Thank you for being here today. We'll see you tonight at 5 o'clock. Otherwise, we'll see you next Sunday for a half of the house. God bless you. We really hope that that encouraged and blessed you. If you made a decision for Jesus, a massive congratulations from us. We would love to be in contact with you, send you a Bible and connect you to a local church. So just below in the details of this episode, there's a different way to contact us. I can encourage you to reach out so that we can help you. Obviously, if you live anywhere near one of our physical locations, we really hope to see you in person very soon. There is nothing like being in the room. Can I also encourage you, if this blessed you, why don't you share this with friends and you know, make sure you pass it on to them as well. Make sure to click, click subscribe so that you don't miss the next episode we send out. God bless you.